Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Welcome back to the Trend Following Trading Club. Uh, and I love our new nickname, the Ideologues. I uh, really appreciate those guys for giving it to us. It's the way nicknames should work, you know. Someone from the outside, inadvertently. Especially in a situation like this where it's sort of menace criticism and we're like, oh no, we embrace it. We love it. Thank you. Give us another one, please. So I'm back in my home state of Virginia where the um, the first Thanksgiving took place. It's um, nice to be up here away from Florida for just a few days. But I'm going back to Florida soon and uh, been doing lots of traveling. But it's been a fun uh, time here and a fun Thanksgiving. And I hope everyone else has experienced the same. I hope you've been following the Twitter accounts. Um, it, we had a lot of good discussions since we last spoke. Um, I enjoyed the Howard Marks. I posted on Twitter some of his quotes, and I actually ended up listening to uh, – it actually is on Spotify as well. Someone reads the whole newsletter, or what does he call it? Um, I forgot what he calls it, but it's they, they read the whole thing on – Spotify. So I, I was able to, on the treadmill yesterday, listen to it. And uh, it's pretty good, you know. And Howard doesn't agree with trading or trend following and things like that, but he does have some good points about um, asymmetry and um, being long term in nature, as do I. I agree with all of that. I don't agree with a lot of things he says, but that was a really nice memo uh, that he put out. Then I also posted one of my favorites this week was a study done by AQR guys concerning their idea that you should a portfolio of stocks would be better off if it was 200 to 300 versus 20 to 30 or something like that. So I think, of course, that kind of started a lot of discussion and I think wasn't based on trend following. It was based on stocks only, but I still think it has some lessons that we, some of us uh, already agree with and that we can learn from um, the importance of trading more markets. I had an offline discussion with Rich about that, and I tried to wrap my head around all the implications and the things that he was tweeting about that idea, but so maybe getting into that some more would be good. And then finally... We have a question from Michael about trading stocks versus indices. So, with that said, I'll let Oleg welcome us. And how are you? And how is Russia? Uh, oh, hi to everyone. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to all the people. And no matter are they from the United States or other different countries, a lot of guys from different countries here, but and I'm from Russia. <laughs> but uh, I want to say that it's very... I have read about this holiday yesterday it's it's a beautiful beautiful story beautiful holiday uh, beautiful narrative and so we all people we all united in our hum, hum, humanity humanity uh, so in our love for god i think so and no matter what religion is what uh, nation is uh, and so and i feel happy when i think about such things and now i'm in a beautiful place near the sea, near the mountains, um, and I feel okay. I decided to go to the beautiful place <laughs> on the Black Sea. Uh, not much people here, so and always okay. And I, of course, I'm very happy. I always say that I'm very happy. Uh, and even no matter what circumstances I have, I'm really very happy. To be in this uh, trading uh, ideologies club, and I like ideology. I think it's I like when it's right ideology, when, it, when it's kind ideology, when it's produ productive ideology, uh, and so it's a very good idea, very good thoughts, and uh, I'm very happy. I always say this, and I will say this over and over again. As I will put my trade over and over again, following the same rules. Okay. G'day, Oleg. G'day, Jerry. 
Um, look, happy Thanksgiving. Um, over here in Australia, of course, we don't have Thanksgiving, so we're a bit envious of you guys over there. But we, I was having a look at Thanksgiving, and I believe it's almost as popular or maybe even more popular than Christmas, which is blowing me away. Sort of Christmas is the only thing we've got to look forward to, but um, I hope you had a great session. I'm looking forward to the chat tonight. Lots of good stuff on Twitter. Um, yeah, and um, I, I particularly liked... Uh, you know, some of this discussion regarding diversification in stocks and the principles around diversification. So looking forward to a good chat. Yeah, I think that uh, Thanksgiving is fun here. And I think today is kind of a semi-holiday as well. Things should be pretty quiet. And then there's a lot of shopping to start the Christmas uh, holidays uh, on, on this Friday. So, and it's kind of uh, nice that um, when the whole world can kind of slow down due to the Americans. And one of my Canadian friends, uh, texted me yesterday, happy, happy United States Thanksgiving. And I was like, okay, let me check that out. So I Googled, uh, is there a Canadian Thanksgiving? And there is. And uh, it's supposed to be similar, and, but it's in October, I believe. So uh, we have to put that on my calendar so I can return the favor next year uh, and wish him a happy Canadian Thanksgiving. So yeah, I wanted, let's just get right into this idea that the AQR guys came up with um, as it relates to um, trading 200 or 300 markets. And I guess some of the points I was a bit confused on is that um, at least I didn't read the entire study. I read the article and their quotes. And I guess I got the impression that um, they, were, they were saying things like it's, it's unfortunate occurrences happen if you trade um, 20 or 30 stocks versus two or 300. So immediately thought of Richard's idea of taking small bets and each um, bet can't really hurt you so much if you're trading so many markets like two or 300. And so when you have that Swiss franc, for instance, a crash, multiple unbelievably number of standard deviation crash that one days, if you trade 20 markets, it's 1 20th versus 200, um, you know, it be, would be barely a blip on your radar. So I wasn't sure if that's where they were going. And then I thought it was particularly interesting to focus, at least initially, on exactly the benefits of trading uh, two or 300 markets. I know that trend following has its own benefits, um, but just to sort of focus in on uh, the and then I guess my my, ex, my other idea was maybe what they're saying is also that um, the equity curve is a bit smoother with ten times as many markets and your equity level is smoother so it when you're calculating your trades based upon your total equity or your closed trade equity or ever how you do it that too would help the KGAR grow faster. So I wasn't really sure. And I, I definitely think that uh, if, you, if you did the same analysis with trend following, obviously it would be different results. Or if you did it with um, trend following just stocks or trend following all the markets, probably, of course, different results. But I think the lessons are still applicable on buy and hold stocks and diversified trend following that two or 300 markets is no worse and probably a lot better than 20 or 30 markets. What do you think, Richard? Yes, Jerry. So, look, my, my thoughts are this, and, um, you know, a lot of people think in a very sort of simple way in relation to diversification, and what they assume is that, um, let's say um, you diversify into 200 markets or 300 markets. What, what they're assuming is that... Um, the, the diversification ultimately approximates market returns. In other words, it all converges to, to beta um, of, of the markets. But that's not the case for trend followers because our systems are not in the market at all times. We are focusing on these outliers. So we're using systems that are very selective in when they enter um, into price movement and um, so with diversification of our models, um, we are focusing on diversifying into outliers. In other words, diversifying within the tail region of the distribution of returns. That means that 
we don't converge to the market beta, we converge to the um, characteristics of the tail regions of all of these liquid markets we diversify into. And one of the things with um, um, diversification and one of the significant benefits is this reduction in selection bias. So I'll give an example in a simple way that we can understand and then as you scale up, you can see how it applies. So let's assume um, we have a 20 market universe. Uh, we're trading with our trend following models, both long and short. Now, without any knowledge about the, the nature of these markets, our assumption is that these liquid markets at any particular point in time could offer outliers. We don't know when, but we know historically when we look at very large data samples that we're probably dealing with about 5 to 10% of the time, um, we might get um, significant outliers, actually probably less than that. So let's assume in this, this, um, this universe of 20 markets, we have, well, let's say 10%. So let's say we have two outliers in that market. Now, if we only diversify into four markets of that possible 20 market universe, there is, um, if, if you look at what are all the possible combinations of four markets in that 20 uh, market universe, and you've got to apply a, a, what you call a permutation calculation, and you'll find that there's about, I don't know, probably about 250,000 combinations of four groups um, selected from 20. And when you're doing this process, you realize that the vast majority of those groups of four markets won't contain any outliers in it. So let's say of those 20 markets, uh, markets one, two, three, or sorry, markets uh, one and two are the only ones that have outliers. Markets three up to 20 don't have any outliers. There are so many different permutations of groups of four within those markets which don't have outliers. You'll find that selection bias is a killer here. But naturally, as you increase diversification, you reduce the number of possible permutations until you get to a total diversification of 20 markets, which there's only one way you can you know, permute um, 20 markets uh, with a 20 market universe. That means you get both outliers, the two outliers in your distribution of trade returns. Now that's without any selection bias because you've chosen the entire universe available to you. So that means now you've got um, your trade distribution reflecting 18 markets of normal, um, normal price action and two markets with outliers in them. Now, when you summate the average of that in, entire 20 market composite, you find that the impact of those two outliers move the average towards higher CAGR. And that's because you've incorporated two nonlinear anomalies in that distribution of 18 other linear results. So the impact of the outliers in that distribution without any selection bias naturally increases the CAGR of the portfolio without any selection bias. Selection bias is a killer here because if you only choose small numbers to diversify into, um, because outliers are unpredictable in nature, we don't know when and where they're going to occur, there's a very good chance if we have a small sample to uh, diversify into, we won't catch any outliers in that distribution. Uh, there's a, a vast sort of probability that you will catch no outliers. But naturally, as you increase the diversification, you therefore increase the number of outliers available in that total composite. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, however, let's, um, let's keep going and talk about the, the choice that all CTAs have, which is to trade at least 40 or 50 or 60 markets that wouldn't be, you know, um, who run substantial businesses, they're going to, they can trade 50, 60 or hundreds if they wanted to in stocks or exotic commodities, uh, over the counter stuff, more currencies, more currency crosses, things like that. So are we just really though back to this whole idea? So, so trading, uh, out of 20 and you choose not to trade even those 20, yeah, that's that's pretty easy to understand. But if you have 40 or 60 and you choose not to trade 100 or 200, is there a problem there? I, I guess I felt like we were just back to the same old idea that, well, not really, because I even had asked you that, are you sort of saying that 
um, if we keep trading hundreds and hundreds of markets, maybe we're we're saying that the and our, our experience is that it's five to ten percent outliers, but it could be more than that if we the, the more markets we trade. And your response was no, that's not going to change. It's probably going to always be this five to ten percent um, number of outliers. So it just I think we're back to this whole idea that the only real difference in trading 50, 60, or 100, or 200, is um, the small bet size. It's not really, because even though the percentage stays constant, um, the number of outliers in our distribution, so now, now we, we're going from percentage terms to now number terms. The number of our outliers um, increases, as does the number of our linear results increases as we increase our diversification. The percentage stays the same but the number of outliers increase. Um, now, the weighting between the outliers, so these outliers are these nonlinear anomalies, maybe eight to 10 orders of magnitude greater than um, the linear um, results. Now, what that does, that puts a progressive weighting on um, your, your performance, not in percentage terms, but in dollar terms. It starts improving your CAGA as you... Um, increase your diversification. And there is no limit to the diversification when you are dealing with these anomalies versus these linear results. There is a limit when you're dealing with um, normal market distributions. But when you're dealing with tail regions, there is no limit. The more outliers you can get into your sample in, in, in actual number terms, not percentage terms, but in number terms, the weighting between the nonlinear anomalies versus the linear results is going to push you towards higher CAGR. So when I look at these distributions and I start summating them up, I see that the percentage doesn't necessarily change, but certainly the CAGR does. Hey, hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, I, I agree with Richard in this, in this sense, and uh, a metaphor that helps me understand this is the following. Suppose you have uh, a number of, of gallons of, of gasoline that you that you want to to uh, uh, put on your car to drive a, a, a number of miles. If you put all the gasoline in one car and and uh, uh, and and go driving that one single car, it may take a lot of time for you to to uh, drive all those miles you want. On the other hand, if you if you put the gasoline, if you spread the gasoline in in uh, different cars, because they're driving uh, simultaneously, the time you will have to wait for the cars to drive the number of miles you want is is lower. Um, so, coming back to the to the trend following portfolio, um, if you wait two hundred years, um, uh, five percent of of the time. Um, uh, that single market you may have devoted your capital to will will uh, provide an outlier outlier that you will, that you will benefit from. On the other hand, if you trade uh, 200 markets, it's high chance that in one single year, five percent of those markets will will provide the outlier you want. So in the end of 200 years, you may have the same uh, the same amount of money um, on on each single market. Uh, uh, on, on, a, on a probability sense, but if you have if you have the if you have the means to uh, uh, get that that outliers in one single year, then we come back to that discussion of of uh, of compounding returns that Richard is is so, is so fond of uh, that you can uh, update your 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 risk level next year because you have benefited from uh, a number of outliers in, in that short time short space of time. That's right, and I'm trying to drag Richard into agreeing with that. He won't, he won't go on record as saying, yes, Jerry, you're right. It is the small losses. They're really, um, this is a major benefit of trading two or 300 markets, and it's the trade level, equity level. It's smoother, and it is, it is pitching in as well because the one thing I left out of my explanation was, um, you know, basically if we're trading – 20, 30, 40, 50 markets, it's still going to be the same maximum risk level as if we trade 200. So I'm still going to, using turtle talk, turtle speak, I'm still going to trade five units with 20 markets. I'm going to divide up 20 markets 
uh, into the five units or 60 markets. I'm still going to trade five units. But let's just say I trade 200 and I'm getting some great diversification because I'm trading some crazy stocks and I've found some over-the-counter stuff. So maybe I'll trade five and a half units with 200. But I'm not, I'm, I can't go too much beyond my max risk budget unless I start to see something amazing in diversification. And, but we know that's going to be very difficult because the markets can, uh, all the stocks can become correlated and all the interest rates and currencies can become correlated. And we can be in a big inflationary environment and everything trends. And then now we're in an environment where we're giving back profit in all the different sectors. So yeah, we got to keep that same budget. We just can't keep adding. You know, we're not trading progressively bigger and bigger as we add markets. We're trading each market smaller and smaller because we're taking uh, the major benefit of trading two or three hundred markets. Is you know, I used to risk twenty-five basis points. Now I risk fifteen basis points. That, that's exactly right, Jerry. And that that's a small bet size. So, if for instance we have the choice of either investing in ten markets with one tenth the allocation each, or one market with 100% of that allocation invested in it, we will always opt for the 10 markets with one-tenth the allocation. So the total risk exposure is the same as the 100% investment in one market versus one-tenth in 10 markets, but also you're getting the correlation benefits of the diversified ensemble of 10 markets, and you're also hunting wider for outliers because any of those markets has a propensity to deliver um, outliers. So that's a small bet size. So there's a number of things going on in diversification. The, the thing that I was talking about in the tw tweets is um, this principle of nonlinear summation, which is different to linear summation. With linear summation, so if we're dealing with the same sort of... Uh, uh, you know, the same degree of magnitude of our losses and our wins, that's a linear summation. And that plots as a mathematical function as a straight line. But when you summate nonlinear um, um, sums together, things that have these outliers in them, you get an exponential function. This is the difference between, um, you know, those people that believe that diversification is just a linear game that sort of has marginal benefits until a particular point in time. And then, you know, diversification is not needed beyond that point. That's the difference. We're saying no, because we've got these nonlinear anomalies that are many orders of magnitude greater than our linear losses and our linear wins. That is what's driving the, the, the KGAR towards improved performance as we increase our diversification. So there's a number of things going on with diversification. Hey, but Rich, I have a question here. Uh, is it, is it um, yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in the limit, you, you're right. If, if we have a completely uh, independent um, outlier generation processes, Surely we would want to to uh, increase our portfolio to to get as many outliers as we can, but realistically, or in the in the in the in the world we live in, is it can, can we uh, can we uh, say that we have these uh, uh, infinite numbers of uh, number of outliers? Can we uh, diversify as much as 400, 500, 1,000 markets? No matter what the number, as they as they come in, or is it the case that some of these outliers will uh, impact uh, 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 sets of markets the same way? I mean, um, there is a, a, a an outlier in a, in market A that behaves not exactly the same, but really really close in market B and C. And actually, if you're trading markets A, B, and C, you're actually trading one market and not three independent return streams. Um, what do you, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, look, I, I agree. During periods of adversity, we get correlation with our outliers. There's no question about that. So in 2008, where we had this major equity market decline, um, there was correlation with the outliers we were getting. Numerous markets were delivering outliers synchronously at the same time. But, you know, during periods of boom, uh, we often get independent outliers. Now, we're long and short, and we, we particularly want to get 
the uh, a dispersion of outliers across the time series. We don't look, even though we do enjoy the fruits of 2008 and we enjoy the fruits of 2022 where outliers were all occurring during the same time during periods of adversity, we're exploding in our equity curves. Now, that's great. However, we'd also like the benefit of having outliers um, that are not synchronously sort of evolving at the same time. And we find that during periods of boom, we often find that markets are operating independently and we get different markets um, giving outliers with no sort of correlated impact on, on other markets or limited correlated impact. This is different during periods of adversity. But ideally, for compound growth over the long term, we want to get a distribution of outliers across the time series. So we're continuously getting this lifting power as opposed to periods of explosion, then periods of significant stagnation, then periods of explosion. We would like, with increased diversification, to get a, a better distribution across the time series. So what, what we've got to do is we've got to recognise that, yes, there are times when things get correlated and we can be on the bad side of correlation. We can find that um, you know um, things all move against us at the same time. So rather than um, increasing our investment in these return streams, we want to dilute these return streams with, with smaller bets. So in other words, one-tenth the allocation across 10 as opposed to 100% allocation in one is the way we do that. So we're not sort of increasing um, our risk. We're actually diluting our risk because we're spreading our bets finer. Now, of course, there's a limit, a, a capital limit that that sort of ultimately tells us how far we can diversify but the sky's the limit with um, greater levels of capital. As, as you have more and more capital, you can diversify with smaller bets, focus on the tail properties of the distribution. Don't focus on being in the market at all times, only focus on that tail distribution and you'll get the, the benefit of the summation of all of those outliers um, reflected in our portfolio returns and they'll be widely distributed and that, that will continuously lift our equity curve. And I want to say that I'm sure that if you have an opportunity, if you have uh, enough money to trade 200 markets, I think uh, the correlation issue is no problem at all. You can not think about a correlation maybe at all because uh, you have 200 different markets. Uh, but on the other hand, and I have said that if your capital is limited, you must, uh, I think, think about maybe common sense of correlation because we can't predict exact correlation. We can only think what looks correlated or not. Um, uh, the few, like Jerry said, the past is, is the nose. The past is the nose, not, is not the best guide here. History is not the, be the best guide here, but... And also, we all see, saw how all the commodities, most of commodities and stocks and all that uh, went to the one direction, into the one direction, into the same direction. So I think, of course, it's uh, very good if you have an opportunity to trade a lot of markets. But if you haven't uh, here a situation when you think about that, all this correlation, but it's not a guarantee. It's not um, a but say it's not a guarantee that uh, if you have chosen a market in terms of correlation with a limited amount of capital, they would not go one day in one direction. There is no guarantee. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, another thing that pops up is that um, what what is how how should we define or how should we look at these outliers, you know, what is an outlier? And um, it's five, we've already said it's five to 10%. I don't know. I was doing some messing around and maybe it's 8% for me. Um, but then you need to put a number on it. And like, what is an outlier? Um, I think in periods like this, where we've had whole sectors moving, um, we are told to trade all the markets, if possible, in the bond sector and the currency sector and the commodities and trade a lot of these stocks as well. Uh, it's not about primarily diversification. It's about uh, 
even within a big sector move, um, some of the markets may really stand out. So if you look back in history of your back test and say, well, what are my five to 10 biggest trades? Well, for your time, your look back period, um, it may be 50 ATRs, 100 ATRs, 200 ATRs. It seems pretty normal that you would say, yeah, mine is 50 ATRs because that makes up 8% of my trades or 10% of my trades. Uh, and so, well, there you go. There's your outliers. And then when you look at your bonds, you may say, oh, I'm really not making 80 ATRs or 50 ATRs on on all of those bonds. It was a nice sector move, but it's only the short-term interest rates that are really getting close to um, this uh, 50 ATR or what looks like historically is is 5 to, five to 10% of my trades. And so... Even within these, uh, even within these sector moves in the currencies that we've seen this year and the interest rates, uh, some of the you'll see some standouts that have made a lot more. The yen, for instance, in the currencies, where at one point it was maybe the pound and the and the gilt market. Um, certainly, the yen may, might be the best of the currency sector. So we get confused, and the industry gets confused that. We, we've we've heard Mark Rozemski on TTU say CTAs make money when everything moves. Well, that's tr- yes, that's kind of true. And we've heard Neil say I don't really see any difference between CTAs that trade fifty markets and those that trade two hundred markets. I think that's kind of true as well. Rich is correct, and Neil's is correct, and Mark is correct in the way they're both correct is Rich is talking about classic trend following, and Mark and Niels are talking about managed futures CTAs, who, if the yen gets to be too crazy, too volatile, it'll get reined in based upon dynamic position sizing, volatility and correlation management. The one hallmark of these short-term interest rates is their volatility skyrocketed. Well, Managed futures CTAs would have cut that back because the vol got too too high based upon the volatility when, when they put the trade on uh, short for the first time. And so that outlier possibility that I got and Rich got because we went short the euro and the Euribor and the short sterling um, and didn't touch that position, they don't get that. They get the smoother equity curve. So Niels never remembers my explanation on this, but I think it's relatively, 95% of the large CTAs, if not 99% of them, always you know, adjust their positions based upon increased volatility, which essentially uh, makes those outlier profits a lot less outlier E. What do you think, Rich? <laughs> yes, a lot less outlier Um Yeah, so... Our method, this philosophical statement we're making is we're focused on the tails. We're not worried about the rest. Um, these other guys, they are they are worried about the rest and they apply these statistical, you know, um, bells and whistles to um, extract a fair bit of alpha out of the things that we don't consider are important. But the reason we don't consider them important is that we know that outliers are undefined in nature and we know that historically we've been presented with a number of outliers but theoretically it's it's potentially unlimited what these outliers could deliver so we're always sort of um, sitting there recognizing that markets over the long term display this universal characteristic of of outliers in these liquid markets Um, but you know, um, there is this possibility that there will be a regime where these outliers explode in magnitude well beyond what even we've experienced historically. So, so this is this is what I'm investing my efforts on. I'm investing on this undefined nature of the outlier. They potentially could be far larger than what we've just historically observed. My method is simply targeting these. So far, my method um, is very you know sound, and I'm able to achieve smoothness with my portfolio return streams because of 
my system diversification, my market diversification, um, the, the vast diversification principles I deploy is what causes the smoothness, but it's not through position sizing. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, the market's nature to deliver these outliers. I'm not looking at um, a means of position sizing method, such as a Kelly criteria or something like that, to invest heavily in any single opportunity, I'm saying I'll apply equal bets, strictly risk manage all of my bets, uh, equally applied to everything I trade, and I'm going to let the markets do the lifting of my equity curve. I'm not going to be applying, applying position sizing methods, which is really just a form of leverage to improve returns based on an assumption that we understand something about these, these trends that we're targeting. And we know that in these, this outlier region or this town region, these exotic trends, um, there is very limited information we can draw on. So these other methods with the bells and whistles, these statistical bells and whistles that they say, you know, like that, um, I think Henrik on um, um, Top Traders Unplugged um, asked that question about the Kelly criteria, he said, I have a simple trend following strategy with some statistical bells and whistles. Now, when I heard that statistical bells and whistles, my ears pricked up and I thought, ah, he's doing something I'm not. Um, and, you know, he therefore is investing his efforts in the Kelly criteria as a means of, of position sizing. And I thought, ah, that makes sense because it's definitely something I'm not doing. And is, I'm not criticising this at all. I'm just saying that my effort is invested in making, you know, getting the lifting power of the markets as opposed to um, investing my efforts in using position sizing um, with the assumption that um, that method of position sizing or increased leverage is going to get me my returns. Uh, and I want to say that in uh, Russia, we have an old saying that you can't spoil uh, the porridge with a butter. And so I think that uh, this is the same situation, the similar uh, situation, because we can't uh, do worse for our portfolio by adding and adding new markets. And I'm sure that if you have an opportunity to do this, at least, it is a good idea. I like this because I like the logic behind this concept. I like this. Um, so, so. You, know, you bring up a really good point, Rich, because... Um... This is what I, I forgot to mention this like last week, but this is the this is a brilliant point, and that is when you run the back test and you and you use dynamic position sizing, the computer is calculating uh, the historical cost of doing that dynamic resizing and what rich is saying is it doesn't know the true cost there hasn't been enough years there hasn't there could be outliers if you throw a 1000 atr profit in that back test it could change the entire results so you essentially have to say there will never be an outlier that would cause my back test to say oops um let's maybe rethink um, sizing based upon ATR. And so if we do get those outlier trades, and that's the genius of trend following, is that it can get worse uh, in, in the future and it can also get a lot better. We're not sort of making this assumption that, well, if I continue to uh, dynamically position size, then there is no cost. There's no cost in your back test. And I think that's the brilliant part is that as soon as you see something you've never seen before. And not, there has been a 1,000 or 2,000 ATR trend. <clears throat> and it was the first Bitcoin breakout, at least in my data. I went back and looked at it a few years ago, and I probably mentioned it on Clubhouse before. But yeah, there, there is definitely some stuff out there that we've never you know, we may never see. And, and a lot of it is due to the ATR at entry. And if you get the ATR small enough in any market, anything can happen if that once, once that market gets going and 
trends get going and fundamentals start to play out, you really can't predict what's going to happen. And I left out the, uh, the commodity moves, especially for me this year or last year. I made money in corn and wheat and soybeans, bean oil, bean meal, and I'm still in the corn and the beans and the oil. But the biggest trends were much, much, much larger in canola, rapeseed, palm oil. You know, you're talking 50 ATRs versus 200. So that's the bummer in thinking you have this sector covered with diversification. Why trade 55 commodities? Brent and West Texas. Because if you look at the data, or you can expect in the future data that you may see something happen in those markets, even though they usually are 90% correlated. Yeah. I want to ask you, I, I, I'm trying to, 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 to understand if, for example, in, you have, like Cherry says, a 50 hours trade, and you're an old school trend follower, which goes up to 50 positions. And then uh, with a 0.2% risk per trade, that will be a 10% return. And if you decide to, to, to get two times the number of instruments, then that will, will have uh, your return uh, related to your equity curve. So you will need another similar uh, outlier to go back to 10. And sorry if I, I am understanding this incorrectly. And, and then what you also said is that the, the, the proportion of outliers to the rest of the average trades doesn't change if you increase the the number of, of instruments. So, for example, something like 2014, when, where there was a, a really good trade in, in crude oil, if I multiply my, my number of instruments by two or by three, that single um, win will not impact as much my, my equity curve. Now, I know that you say, well, but you will have more outliers and maybe that will smooth also your equity curve because it will happen at different times. But I, I can understand the, the way that the number of outliers, given that they are the, at the same proportion that it was previously, uh, arrives to a much better KGAR. Yeah, so, okay, what, what I'm doing is I'm saying this 5 and 10% is based on what history has presented us. So um, what does change the, the number of outliers in our distribution is our look back. It's not our diversification. So um, if we increase our look back, we do get a um, increasing quantity of outliers in our distribution. That, that's, that's through our look back. Our diversification is a means to um, improve correlation benefits of the ensemble. So, and, and so... We are fighting, with diversification, we're fighting with two things. We're fighting with um, the outliers that are giving us our beneficial growth, and we're fighting against the whipsaws and the losses of those markets, which is detrimentally subsidised or, or detracting from those outliers. So with increased diversification, we are getting correlation improvements of all of those linear losses and wins. They're offsetting each other. So um, we, we're getting a correlation benefit. And um, we're also getting this mathematical property that as because we are dealing with a distribution that contains linear points or linear results of losses and wins plus non-linear results of many orders of magnitude greater than that, when you summate those series, it, when you conduct the average over your portfolio, if, you, for instance, you had um, linear results across your entire portfolio and we average that portfolio, the average of that portfolio is going to plot in the mean or the median of that distribution. But because we've got outliers in that series and we've got linear results as well, when we average the ensemble of those data points, we're actually getting a shift of KGAR away from the mean or the median of the um, linear distribution towards higher KGAR. Now, because these outliers, because of our trend following models, these outliers are not adverse outliers, they're beneficial outliers. 
they are moving our CAGR beneficially to higher levels. That's because we cut losses short and let profits run uh, with our system. So there's this mathematical property, which is an exponential function, which is shifting. A power law is shifting our CAGR to, the, to um, improve CAGR because of our diversification principles. To increase the number of outliers in our distribution, we're going further in look back. We're increasing our look backs. And, and that, that, that is according to what I've done in my research, is that <clears throat> as you increase the look back, you are reducing the number of whipsaws or the number of um, losses um, and, and small linear trade results in your histogram as you increase the look back. I put a couple of posts up on Twitter which demonstrated the same trend following model with different look backs, um, one of a short um, time frame series and one of a medium to long term time frame series. They're both capturing outliers, but the short term model is being uh, detrimentally affected by the number of small linear losses um, that occur with the short term time frame. Well, thanks. And so what you say is that adding uh, to your menu of instruments, if you are a short term trader, it will be uh, less good or will it di uh, directly won't work? Yes. Yeah, so look, this is, this is my recipe. Um, my recipe is um, I will always prefer to increase my levels of diversification. There is no limit to my diversification. I'll also be, as I'm um, increasing my diversification, I'm going to be reducing my bet size to um, eliminate the concentration of any particular single return stream. Because what happens, you know, if, if for instance, you're trading a linear and nonlinear series, it's scale independent. In other words, um, you know, if I trade one-tenth with the position size, I still get that asymmetry in the distribution, even though it's one-tenth as strong as if I'm investing 100% in that, that um, return series. So um, it's scale independent. The asymmetry is still there. That's a critical thing for diversification. That asymmetry is what's creating this exponential function when you're summating them all together. So I, I go small bet size, increase diversification, and at the same time, I will um, progressively get longer in look back. Those three things are doing all different things, but they're all related. And it's, I think that's a recipe for how I improve my smoothness of my returns and I catch more outliers. Hi, guys. Um, I hope everyone else is well. Hey, Jerry. Um, you know, I was just thinking about this point of trading more and more markets and diversifying and you know of course if you if you trade all the market x your results are going to be uh, matching more or less the index you know if you trade 2000 stocks in the russell 2000 uh your differences um you know your you're going your results are going to be very similar to what the russell 2000 provides you uh, constantly. Uh, only if you're in the market at all times, Alp. If you're trading a trend following model that is selective when it comes in, so it's only trading in the tail region, you're approximating the tail characteristics of the distribution. You're not, you're not approximating the index. You're not, but still trading 2,000 out of 2,000 um, will get you closer to, so there will be diff so there will be differences from what you have mentioned. There will be differences due to market cap uh, weighted index versus equal weighted cap uh, element. There will be differences due to um, costs of trading uh, so many stocks in one time. However, you know um, I think even even uh, even Jerry is not trading two thousand stocks um, at, at the moment. So you know. It, you know, if, if we are talking about the principle of um, trading as many instruments as possible, I think there is a li there is a limit, and uh, the more we trade, the, the there is a good chance that we might get closer to the the index, uh, the the actual index. So that's that's one point that I would like to mention, and the, the second one is the you know. What we are trying to do is, of course, I'm trading these hourly bars. And when you trade long-term models, 
uh, the number of opportunities is less. And when you trade uh, our uh, Al, can I just ask you something? Um, isn't it the buy and hold model that approximates the index? In other words, we're trading both long and short. How does that, therefore, as we trade more and more markets, approximate the um, the index when we're trading both long and short? Um, a buy and hold will, as we increase in the number of buy and holds, um, that will approximate an index because it's always in the market at all times. But um, if we are long and short and only participating in, in extreme price moves, I don't understand how we approximate the index. Uh, you, you're going to be closer. You know, if you trade 2,000 trades in Russell 2000, um, you know, and, uh, you know, the only difference is going to be, A, uh, as you have mentioned, if you're taking a very long look back, then what is going to happen is uh, with that large look back, uh, of course, you're going to be uh, in, 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 in the market majority of the time for majority of those uh stocks and um uh, but the there will be advantages like you will be uh equal weighted not market cap weighted and you will incur more costs so you know i'm not so that's that's why i think 300 or 400 or 500 makes sense but trading 10000 in instruments or trading 100,000 instruments like MSI World Index. You know, how many stocks are there? 100,000 stocks. I don't think that this is going to create um, additional alpha into the trend followers portfolio. I think there is, uh, you know, the, the marginal benefit is going to be less and less as we, you know, go from, you know, 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. But that's uh, what what I think about it. And uh, I haven't made a quantitative analysis about that, so I might be wrong on this one, but that's, you know, what I can imagine at this point. Thank you. Yeah, one, one of the issues I've got is that um, my, my view is that we cannot say that um, over the long term each, each of the markets produces the same number of outliers. I mean, you know, some, uh, you know let's, let's take stocks, for example. Let's compare the rise of Amazon. Let's comprise the rise of Tesla. Um, compare them to the average stock. Um, you know, we get the, the, these outlier impacts affect these stocks to such a degree that they are hundreds, two hundreds orders of magnitude greater than um, the average stock. And the vast majority of average stock also declined to zero over the course of time. So, yeah, I, I, I just, um, yeah, I, I think when we're dealing with outliers, we're dealing with a different story to when we're dealing with, um, you know, um, the standard returns delivered by any particular market. Yes. Also, just one thing to mention is, you know, increasing more markets makes sense if your outliers are also increasing in proportion to the markets that you're adding, right? Because you, you keep on reducing your risk, Richard. So, you know, if you are trading 100 markets, you're you know, you're dividing entire your risk budget to 100. But if you're trading uh, 200, then you're dividing your entire risk budget to 200. But if you're dividing, if you're trading 1,000 or 10,000, of course, you're dividing your entire risk budget to this 10,000 stocks. So, you know, so of course, when you trade all the stocks in the Russell 2000, hopefully you're going to end up with more uh, outliers. You know, not that, like that's that. right, Al. I'm, I'm talking percentage terms, it doesn't necessarily change, but raw number terms, of course it does as you increase your diversification. So, you know, it's all it's all relevant, relative, um, you know, but uh, what is important is that the, the progressive asymmetry of the addition of these, these things into your ensemble, because so much of what um, diversification is about is reducing selection bias. Um, so, when you trade the entire possible market portfolio with our trend following models, we get all possible outliers in that distribution. And if, if there is, say, 5% or 10% or, or so um, outliers in that distribution, the raw numbers as we're increasing our diversification is going to significantly increase, but it's all relative to also the numbers that um, don't deliver outliers. In order to get the sample size we need, on our back test, we're going to trade all these markets with the same systems. 
and the same unit size. And and when we when we look at the results, and someone says, "What's your expectation per trade in corn?" Well, it's the same as it is in all the markets. What about crude? The same. So you mean to say to me that all the markets have the same expectation, and you expect the same thing, the same thing from each of them as it relates to the possibility of an outlier trade? And our answer is yes, we do. We don't look at any individual market. We can't predict how many outliers we'll have in the, in the future, of course, but we de we definitely assume that we'll have. By adding markets, we we're not we're doing the opposite of what most people do when they trade twenty or thirty or five, is that they really are guessing that they chose the five right ones. We're saying we're so bad at this guessing. The way to continue to increase our chances of getting these outliers is continue to add more and more markets. Invalidate the assumption that. Uh, uh... Uh, the expectation for one uh, return stream would be different from the from another one. I mean, where we don't want to be is is in a place. I've, I've where, done that, um, Bruno. I, I've done that. I've, I, so I posted, I posted the um. So there's a post I did which looked at um, effects of diversification as you increase your levels of diversification. So what I did was I took um, a portfolio. I think it was of of 30 possible markets. Um, then what I did was I said, right, now let's look at, let, let's um, apply um, a, 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 a four group portfolio of the 30 markets. And I plotted the distribution of returns and it produces this big dispersed array of um, returns with um, various CAGR and various drawdowns. There was a, quite a, a dispersed plot of, of possible four group combinations. And what happened then was, okay, let's increase the diversification of that 30 market portfolio to 15 markets. When you plot them, you find that um, they cluster you know, in a far less disseminated manner um, and they move to the right. And when you go to the 30 market portfolio, um, it significantly shifts to the right once again and your concentration of returns of your portfolio significantly reduce in dispersion. This is a feature of... So the reason those four groups of portfolios were so highly dispersed, and these were portfolios over, a, a, I think, a 30-year 30, 30 period of these different markets and their possible combinations with a trend-following model. The reason was that dispersion is that there is considerable dispersion in the number where the outliers exist in that series. They are not that each market does not possess the same number of outliers. You know, there are significant differences in which markets are delivering outliers, but we never know which markets they're going to be, but we just know that that occurs. That creates a significant dispersion. And with selection bias, it becomes a real problem because we want we don't know where these outliers are going to be, and we need to therefore um, remove this selection bias to give us the greatest chance of capturing, capturing as many outliers in our distribution as we can with diversification. This term selection bias kind of threw me off because I think if you ask people who trade 20, 40 markets, you could say, well, you have selection bias. And then they'd say, no, 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 I don't have any bias at all. I, I trade two, three, four from each sector. And so that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about by the mere fact that you don't trade as many as you can or as many as you should, you have created this selection bias. Not, nothing that... In That's right. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Bruno. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I, I, I agree completely with you guys. Um, I, what I'm asking is, well, there are some markets that are obviously equal. I don't know. Uh, if you want to trade Nikkei in Singapore or in Tokyo, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, no, no reason to, to add uh, these two and call their different markets. Uh, but beyond these uh, obvious uh, uh, um, similarities, is, is, is there any way for us to, uh, or that you would uh, entertain that uh, would um, provide us any information whether markets are at least slightly different? I know Jerry talks a lot about Brent and, and WTI, and yeah, they're a lot similar, but Sometimes they are different, and that's when it matters uh, the most. But what about the others? Do do we 
do we have all these mar uh, different markets? In, in other words, yeah, okay, uh, 40 markets, it seems a, a low number. 200, mm, okay, should it move for, from 200 to 400 to 800 to uh, 1,000? I don't know. What do you think? Hi, guys. Yeah, hi, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. A yeah, very interesting discussion on uh, diversification. And uh, if if I'm an ideologue in anything, that's that's diversification. Even more so, uh, I would rank diversification, then asymmetry, then trend following in terms of my ideologies. So uh, to me, the diversification is by far the most... Um, I don't know, the most valid ideology one can hold on to. And to answer this question on diversification, my simple conclusion has been, after analyzing this a lot, is that uh, the optimum is the maximum. So the, the optimal number of markets that you should trade is the maximum that you could possibly trade. And if you can trade 100,000 markets, you should trade 100,000 markets. It's much better than 50,000 markets. Mm. And to put a color as to where this comes from and how I explain it, Richard's, Richard's argument is very powerful, and I agree with it, but I would also try to make a more universal argument. <clears throat> so let's first start with the definition of an outlier. Jerry asked a very good question maybe 20, 30 minutes ago. What is an outlier, and how do you define an outlier? Well, obviously... An outlier is system dependent. So, the, so let's say when when Jerry says um, there is an outlier of fifty ATR. Well, that outlier is a fifty ATR outlier with that system on that market that Jerry just backtested or tested or ran it in in real life. If the system was slightly different. Let's say the trailing stop was not, I don't know, a certain look back or a certain ATR, number of ATRs. Let's say if the trailing stop was a tighter stop. Let's say the trailing stop was just two ATR at all times or one ATR. Very tight trailing stop. The same system, same breakout, same rules and whatever, with a tighter ATR, ATR stop would have not produced a 50 ATR trade. But what it would have produced, and depending on the, how that market moved and how the price action developed between entry and the 50R exit, that sh tighter, tighter stop uh, system may have produced five, seven ATR trades. So enters, catches, catches five ATR, then gets stopped out, then Again, again, get, gets in again. Then it catches eight ATRs, and then it gets stopped with a one ATR stop, then gets, gets in again. So the same system for which 150 ATR is one outlier trade could have created um, five trades, seven ATR each, and captured 35 ATRs out of those 50. Because, of course, it got stopped out, it got, got a whipsaw. So you paid for the whipsaw. So for the price that you paid for the whipsaw, that 50, 15 ATR that you can, quote unquote lost versus the 50 ATR trailing stop. But what did you get? Instead of getting one trade, one sample size, you got five trades added to your sample size with a much more regular risk to reward distribution where the, the risk was a certain, losses were a certain level, the profits were, were, were a certain level. So you're getting much more normalized returns and you're increasing your sample size. And on top of it, a lot of those 50 ATR <coughs> outliers as a one trade would have given back 10 ATR when it exited. Whereas this guy, as it's getting with five trades, seven ATR each, once it's out, it's out. So the, the give back, when the trend stops, it's not going to be as big as the big 50 ATR trade that gave back 10 ATR and exited. So yeah, it captured 40 ATR versus the 35 with the five, five trades, seven ATR each. So just to, to 
to understand what is ATR. So Jerry and Richard would say, well, this other system that is much more, you know, exiting much, much quicker and trading much more, has much more trading costs. Well, that one doesn't capture ATRs, doesn't capture as many outliers as my system does. I would argue, no, that system also captured most of your 50 ATR outlier, except he doesn't call it as an outlier. He called it as, you know, five different trades, seven ATR each. And he has many more of those seven ATR trades than you have trades in your system or in outliers. So now how, how, do, we, how do I connect this whole thing with diversification? When you trade, even in one sector, even with stocks, even with 2,000 Russell stocks, depending on your system, so, so when, when Jerry says, oh, some markets gave me a lot of outliers, some markets didn't give me as many outliers, that's, again, system dependent. So if you have different systems trading different markets, you may or may not get outliers. So exposing yourself to as many markets, even in the same sector, and as, to as many systems and as many time frames as possible, you expose yourselves to many different developments of price action in which you will capture the price movement in different ways. Some systems will capture one move as one trade, which is a 50R trade. Some systems will capture it with five trades, seven ATR each. Some systems may not capture much at all. They may get whipsawed, but on the another market, they may actually be beneficial. So, the benefit of the, the bias selection goes much wider than just markets. The selection bias, uh, the selection bias can hurt you from not trading as many markets as possible, not being exposed to different systems that can capture different price actions and to as many different time frames as possible. So, of course, the experienced traders like Jerry and Richard have already sensed the benefit of diversifying different systems and different time frames. Because yes, trends the market can 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 trend in many in infinite number of ways. And in order for you to expose yourself and benefit from the infinite number of ways that a certain market can go from point A to point B, you have to expose yourself to as many um, reflections of that move in that sector. So 2,000 stocks can go up over three years in infinite number of ways. So Amazon can go in one way and much more, much stronger. Tesla can go in another way. Exxon can go in a certain way in another way. So when you expose yourself to 2,000 of them and, ex and overlay as many systems and timeframes over as many stocks, then you let then into this three-dimensional matrix, you, you let this three-dimensional matrix decide on your exposure and your profits that you get, that you extract from, from that universe with it, all those systems and with those time frames. So when you look at it from a holistic perspective, trading as, as many market systems and time frames as possible, it's actually a system in its own. You're actually adjusting your overall risk allocation in the whole sector and letting all the markets, all the systems, and all the time frames vote for how exposed you should be to this sector. And it becomes a system for itself, which is much more different than just picking one, two, or three stocks from this universe and training it with one system and one time frame. So the superiority of the former model is orders of magnitude better than the second. That, that's how I would explain this. Okay, I agree with like all of that, except the parts you left out. So I'm going to, I, I think that's a brilliant summary. And I agree, with, especially with the first parts of trading 100,000 and 60,000 is not as good as trading 100,000. I think that's exactly the way you want to think. Try to take these concepts to some sort of limit and see how far you can push them. However, you left a few things out. And uh, now, 
I, and I have been on record many times saying that, honestly, you should trade as short-term as possible. Now, you can't trade systems that don't make money. Right, so I want to trade a very short-term system. Well, it doesn't make money. Well, I'm, then I'm not going to trade it. And another caveat is that, um, having spoken with you for a while now, uh, Richard and I would would not be able to choose some of the systems that you trade. We would say, no, we're not going to actually choose those. However, if you had, if you if you meant that you'll stick to the Jerry and Richard approved systems uh, and that you should trade these breakouts. So um, 20 day breakouts, 50 day breakouts, hundred day, 200 multiple breakouts that I'm with you. Right. But if you do the back test, which is Richard has mentioned many times and in, on this um, spaces today, that, just by using breakouts for entries and exit, one entry, one exit, and a stop loss, the back test will say, do not trade those short-term breakouts. You do not make money. So I agree with everything you've said, but the way to trade very short-term is to trade with volatility management, uh, correlation management, increasing your positions when the vol goes down, decreasing them when it goes up, and Richard and I are going to choose not to utilize those type of systems. So, um, but I do agree, and, and Richard and I do trade multiple breakout or chandelier type exit systems. So we don't, but they're all in this medium to very long term, um, and we're and we are limiting ourselves to systems that actually have made money on the back test. Uh Yes. So when I gave that example with the 50 ATR and uh, five trades, seven ATR each, that doesn't necessarily mean that you would be doing it with a shorter term system, Jerry. I think you could be even have like a 200 or 300 day breakout. But if your exits are tight, like if your trailings, trailing stops are tight, you will get shaken out much more. And you're still kind of watching out. So if a market's going up, you're going to get, instead of capturing one 300-day breakout, you will capture five of them. You, it's, except you're just going to be shaken out more. So that doesn't necessarily mean that to have more trades doesn't necessarily mean that you have to trade with a shorter time, time frame look back. Of course, now it all depends on the system and on the back tens. And I agree that if you have a system that doesn't make money in any of your markets, then of course you shouldn't trade it. You're obviously over trading or your transaction costs are too big. That's why you backtest. So you, you, of course, you're not blindly going to trade things that don't, don't make sense. I'm saying that if there is a way, and I have seen ways, I have, when I've tested systems, I have found different ways of, of cutting, uh, you know, skinning the, the cat. There's just different ways how to capture certain moves. You can capture capture them with one 50, 50 ATR trade or with five, seven ATR trades. And it's your choice. Or you can trade both. And in some ways, the five times seven ATR system will be beneficial on one market, in one stock, and the 150 ATR win will be beneficial, more beneficial in another market. And they're still very, very correlated. Like they could be in the same sector, same stocks. What, so what I my point was that when we say markets are correlated or similar, uh, that's that's just in the price space. In the price domain, they could be ninety five percent correlated, but in overall movement, like how they move in very small intricacies, like how big the drawdown was, the sell off one versus the other, and and whatever in which your system can, can sense a difference. So, so two markets which are 95% correlated, one of them can shake you out of your system, another one won't. So two markets which are 95% correlated, one of them can shake you out after 15 ATRs and may never get bet you in or get you in and whipsaw you. And another one, because it traded slightly differently, it may not shake you out and get you to go all the way to 50 ATR. So when you go to your backtest, they say, wow, I'm trading crude and Brent 
but one gave me 50 ATR and the other one only gave me 15. And then it whips on me and lost me six ATR and I only made nine. And they are 95% correlated. More like when you see the price action, anybody will see, wow, Brent and crude, they kind of move the same way. But nobody knows how the small differences between one and the other market can get expressed in your system. That's why I say outliers are system dependent. And that's why I think diversification is so powerful. Because you never know in the future how similar markets can react differently to the systems that you're trading. That's my universal point that I wanted to make. Yes, I agree. Um, when I was with the Turtle program, because the systems were very short term, the outlier trade was defined as 20 ATR profit. And now that my look back is so long term, hundreds of days, I would say that the outlier trade is now 50 to 100 ATRs. But I, do, I don't think that it's um, correct to say that, um, you know, if you're looking at the 200 day high and your exit is a two ATR, that that's a long term look back. I mean, you've got to either base it on the exit. So it's a very short term look back if you're going to give it two ATRs or 10 days lower, like the turtles, 20 days lower. Uh, or you got to combine the two. Okay, I have a long term look back on the entry and I have a very short look back or short exit. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a combination of the two. Most systems are the entry exit parameters are closer than 200 versus 10 days or 200 versus two ATRs. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that, Jerry. I just made, made an extreme example to, to prove my, to show my point. It was a hypothetical example. It was almost like a reductio ad absurdum to, to e exemplify how things could differ, like in terms of how outliers are defined. So in, for one system, outlier is one thing, and what's an outlier for one system, it's not an outlier for another. And whether you captured it or not is also a question. You can capture an outlier with multiple trades with a simple system. As long as you captured most of it, you can't. You don't have to call it an outlier. You still captured it. That's that's my. That's all I wanted to say. And that's a very strong point, absolute. Because you know um, we we often talk about how you know highly correlated Brent and crude are, but if you trade both of those markets with different systems you break down that level of correlation between them. You're still getting significant outliers in both series, but they're not necessarily outliers that are coinciding together. And that is because of the system configurations, which is, is significantly altering the distribution uh, through the diversification of systems, timeframes, that sort of thing we're deploying in addition to our market diversification. Yep, I agree. So, yeah, we, we reach... I mean, me and Richard came to the same conclusion that the optimum is the maximum, but probably through different uh, different roads and journeys. But I think we arrived to the same point. And I think we, we're using different language and philosophy, but I think we're thinking the same, actually, just talking in, in slightly different language. Yeah, I agree with all everything you said. Um, if you can get those short-term systems to... Um, to have a healthy average trade and to be um, have a robustness that you're comfortable with, uh, then I've said many times, trade as short-term as possible. Now, you may look back and say, for heaven's sakes, trading uh, all of these markets really small and trading uh, once a year, okay, I see what I'm giving up. I'm giving up uh, some, it's going to be lumpy, it's going to be more volatile, but it seems to, to me to be a whole lot of work to trade shorter term. And I have these trading costs and commissions and slippage to include. So I get it. I have found shorter term systems, but I, can't, I am going to choose quality of life and, uh, to, uh, and just tell my clients, look, deal with it. If you, if you don't like this bumpiness and, uh, in, the, um, in the way these longer term systems work, then you can leave. But I do think you, you might still choose to be longer term because of the quality of life aspect and um, 
you know, having to be so on and so good with execution and slippage. And trading shorter term systems also is a little scary, probably in some of the less liquid markets. And I trade a lot of less liquid markets, and I mentioned them today. Um, rapeseed, canola, palm oil, bean oil, and those have had some of the better trends recently. Well, Jerry, I, uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, I also don't like short-term systems. I I don't trade short-term systems. So the, the, without divulging too much, but yeah, I, everything that I said is is relevant and valuable to the time frames that you and Richard are, are trading. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to short term or trade a lot. Um, oh, I wanted to also add another benefit of diversification. Another advantage of trading 200 versus 20 markets or um, 5,000 versus 100 is... Um, as Jerry said, you increase your sample size, but you also prove the robustness of your system because every market that you add to your universe of systems and your universe of systems and time frames survives all these additional markets that you're adding to it, that you're throwing at it, and it's not getting its knees broken and it doesn't fail and it keeps in backtest first, it keeps showing similar statistical performance. Actually, even if you don't trade the 2,000 markets and you only trade the 100, it improves your confidence that the system that you're trading on the 100 markets that you're trading is actually something of value. Because if you built this system, I don't know, 20 years ago on some data, which was historical data then, and you on 40 markets... And you only slightly changed it as you added 60 new markets to 100. And then you tested it on 100 more markets, which you haven't added. And then you tested it on 1,000 more markets, which you, which you have or haven't added. This only proves the robustness of your system because all of that is out of sample data. All of that is out of sample data proving the validity of your system. Now, the... The, the beauty of it is that by proving the robustness, you're actually also noticing that the, as you add more markets, your risk to reward ratio improves. Your reward to risk ratio improves. So that proves to you that if your universe of timeframes and system is robust and superior, as you test, Adding more markets, the tests will convince to you and prove to you that 100,000 markets is better than 2,000. And if it doesn't, you need to question the robustness of your system. So this is my point. This is a very powerful point. If adding more markets to your system does not improve performance, that should put more doubt into the robustness of your system and it should make you more conscious of any selection bias that you may or may not have in terms of how, how fit your system is to the small universe that you selected to test it on and trade it on. And this is, I think, maybe the most important point about diversification. Very uh, good, think, uh, Very good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, very interesting to hear, yes, absolutely. because I think that, of course, we all know here that diversification is one of the main parts of our trend following process. Uh, the fact of a diversification is one of the main parts. For me personally, two main parts, um, it's uh, diversification and risk management. So, and uh, I think that position, position sizing is a part of a risk management for me personally. I define it so. Of course, position sizing, but it's part of risk management. So, and so, of course, as I have said before, that uh, more diversification we have, at least we will not do worse for our portfolio, only maybe execution problems or something like this. And we must also think think about such things, I think. But, of course, we, but... <clears throat> When we are talking about shorter term system, I have said before, it's another topic and I know what I'm talking about. Um, I think that uh, shorter term systems 
uh, maybe they are not such a robust when we do it in a pure trend following manner. But when we apply trend following principles, uh, I have seen this when we apply trend following system principles to almost all areas of our daily routine, daily life, it's powerful. It's powerful even we when we do something like uh, we do uh, calls. Uh, I worked as a uh, manager in uh, sales manager, and when you call to ten, uh, one hundred different guys, and you offer them uh, some commodity or something like this, and such type of uh, business, uh, you will have a better result when you go call ten guys, of course. And we can, of course, we can apply this, all this, but uh, in a pure trend following space, I think a lo longer system works uh, better, I think so. But short term, it's doable. But uh, I have said before that it's uh, some filters, it's maybe, it's, I think it's not uh, so classical. It's not so classical to follow and if we do it in a short term space, it's my opinion, to be effective. You know, it's interesting that uh, I'm. You know, there's no one else here that trades short-term systems apart from myself, I guess. So I traded this year. Uh, this was my first year, and uh, I think the results are all right. Uh, you know, considering the fact that it was my first year, and it is the same principle. So, so what is different? I mean, in the short-term space, I'm trading hourly bars, and when you trade hourly bars, of course, you're much more. Um, algorithmic and you're much more, I would say, automated. Um, so there are differences in how you execute it. Um, so your work and life balance is not necessarily uh, worse off uh, because the trades are being taken uh, by automation. So you don't actually do, do these trades uh, on your own. So it doesn't matter whether you're trading 1,000 trades or 10,000 trades as long as uh, the, exec the execution is, is being done automated. And as a short-term trader, I got used to thinking like a technology business as well. So I think like a data business. So the more, so at the, at the moment, I'm trading hourly bars, but I'm improving my system. So last year, I traded hourly bars using hourly bars database. So this year, I'm moving to trading hourly bars, but using minute data or five minute data to be precise. So so this is, so last year I have executed my system once every hour, but this year I can execute my system every five minutes or every 10 minutes or any, any time frame between five minutes to one hour. And there's a lot of uh, flexibility in execution. So, and, and a database, formed by five minute data means that uh, I, I'm dealing with more than 100 million data points. So if this doesn't make me a data business, nothing will. So I, I so that's why I need to think with all the uh, principles that we, we talk about, but I also add a, you know, a code development process. Uh, the algorithms are very serious because everything else is automated. And then you have this data science, data cleansing, uh, and data management processes to be able to ensure that this this data has been uploaded to your database and so on and so forth. So there are additional complexities around uh, to be able to do this sort of uh, short-term trading. Uh, but it is possible. You know, we are in you know 2022 and it is possible. And if you're aiming 20 to 30 percent CAGR with your systems, I guarantee you, you can make the same sort of uh, returns with short-term systems, and it will give you more diversification. And because everyone loves diversification, it is not possible to diversify without adding hourly bars or minute bars into your systems. So that's that's my belief, and that's what I wanted to share. Thank you, guys. Uh, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, interesting conversation. Uh, the... Uh, as far as diversifying to thousands of stocks, so you, you, we have to keep in mind that uh, stocks highly correlate when there is a crash. So diversification helps because uh, uh, it may catch the, those ones that back the trend. 
However, over the long term, there is a sweet spot because the annualized return drops. And at some point, you make a lot less than buy and hold because stocks, okay, are supposed to go up in the long term. Uh, so it depends on your objective. If you are a, a speculator, uh, if you work for yourself, you can take the risk for a higher return. But if you are managing money, maybe the customers won't like a 60% drawdown. So it, it's all uh, relative, uh, I, I believe. And it uh, also depends on how you choose the stocks. So uh, like if you're going to choose 200 stocks, you choose them a priori or you have a score function and will the score function pick up those stocks that back the trend uh, when the markets crash, like in 2008 or the pandemic crash. And uh, it's all, it, it all depends on objectives. I, I don't think there is a clear answer uh, what's best in this. Uh, uh, you know, if, if I were a fund manager, uh, I would try to find a sweet spot or, uh, you know, maybe 500 stocks or something like this. Uh, uh, if I'm completely risk averse, I would go to a thousand stocks, but then uh, the drawdown will drop. Uh, it's a bias variance trade-off ultimately, but uh, but uh, I shouldn't expect to make any alpha uh, by doing this. Just uh, stay afloat. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's difficult for us to give advice to. Uh, stock people like if someone came to us and said hey um tell me how to do better with my stocks you know the first thing i would say is well don't trade just stocks you've got to have an equal weighted portfolio with currencies commodities stocks bonds a few crypto futures and um shorts as well well you know so uh, we're, we're asked to be crisis alpha for these dysfunctional portfolios that are set up in a way that we just fundamentally disagree with. So um, now, um, and there are periods where not only, well, you know, we've seen these periods where stocks are highly correlated and well, you know, that could be okay. It would be much, much better today because I'm long a lot of stocks and I'm short a lot of stocks. So if they got, uh, a big sell-off here now, then I'm going to be a lot better off than I was around COVID when COVID hit because I was long everything. But, uh, Jerry, you had currencies, commodities, and stocks as well. Well, I was long all of those, and all of those got crushed. So it wasn't just that the stocks crashed. And it's not just if they do. It's when they do, and what's my underlying positions? Is it a period like now where there's, where there's the only diversification I have now is – in the stock market because of the way it's been behaving over the past year, there's a fair amount of shorts. Uh, but there's no longs in the currencies. They're all short. There's no longs in the interest rates. They're all short. Maybe it's a mixed bag in the commodities. But for one, for one point in time, we were long all the commodities as well. So it's there's no place to hide sometime. If you're long everything or short everything, that you're going to be vulnerable to uh, you know, a big give back, and of course, from us, we'd also say, "Okay, yeah, you're right. I did have a big give back, but my trailing return on a 12 month basis was 35 percent." Oh, so you built up all these profits? Yes. So that matters as well, in my opinion. I wanted to mention something on Alp, which is that um, I support Alp in his um, short term trading, primarily. Because I know Alp, and he he he's a truth teller, and uh, and he has the ability to um, technology wise and smart wise come up with short term systems. But I think my negative experience on short term systems was not using uh, hourly bars; it was using um, daily bars. And so I think that that's probably one of the keys is to use hourly bars um, and use a good solid trend system, which I know Alp uses. And uh, I'm not surprised that he's been very successful. 
And finally, I wanted to, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to comment on absolute. That's brilliant. Uh, uh, I was thinking the same thing as you were saying that, that, but in a, in a slightly different way. But it's a brilliant uh, analysis because I agree with it. And so it's obviously brilliant. But, and this is this idea to trade, uh, do a back test on as many markets as possible, even if you don't plan on trading all those markets. Now, a couple of caveats. I wouldn't, I'm not usually very concerned about anything out of sample. Um, out of sample sounds like a good idea. I'm not sold on it. And by definition, it almost is saying I would prefer something recent over more, more sample size. So I'm going to always say screw recent. And uh, I certainly want more sample size. So if I had a situation where I wanted to test thousands of markets or hundreds of markets, it didn't exist when my first system was designed. Number one, I would choose the system. I would update my system. I would choose the system that was the best systems over these hundreds or thousands of markets with never any intention of trading more than 40. Because what I'm seeing is, it's just like, not only am I looking into history, but I'm looking at markets that I'm not even going to trade because I'm seeing more data. And I'm going to, and I'm all, if I was to trade them or not to trade them, I think that I'm getting valuable information from looking at the entire sa uh, sample of data, thousands of stocks that's going to have an influence on the parameters I choose, even though I'm not going to trade those stocks. And I would update my parameters because I have more new information now. And if my system was not as good because I, I formulated it on 20 markets, then obviously I'm expecting it to be much better if I'm looking at hundreds or thousands of markets. And another thing too is um, I would not, I feel comfortable with this because it doesn't sound right because most people, when they do a back test, they pay a lot of attention to the equity curve. You're not going to get that same performance if you don't trade all those markets that you just did the back test on. Well, I'm never thinking that I'm going to get similar performance on the equity curve by looking at a historical back test. I want to walk away from that back test having more knowledge and more comfort and confidence in the trade stats, the average trade, the average win, the average loss, the win percentage, the win loss ratio. And who the hell knows how those markets are going to play out. Trend follower doesn't look at historic returns and says, hey, you know, one of these days we're going to get a NASDAQ move like we saw in the 90s. No, would never walk away with that. He walks away with the average trade is three ATRs. I have some 50 ATR, 100 ATR mega trades. My win percentage is 40%. That's all I can take from that back test. Let's get going. What do you think, Richard? Yeah, Jerry. So <clears throat> the way I view <clears throat> all of these different markets is that I'm viewing them as alternate possible histories. In other words, because uh, we don't know what's going to come in the future um, and we know that the future might rhyme, but it's not going to repeat, we want a, a, a process that um, rigorously and robustly tests over vast different um, alternate possible histories. So we're applying the same normalised trend-following models across a vast array of different data sets, you know, maybe 200 markets or 200, sorry, return streams. Um, each, <clears throat> each of those return streams is an alternate possible history. That's the best way to go into an uncertain future um, as opposed to investing all your efforts in, in one historical return stream. Um, <clears throat> and and when, when you look at the markets, um, we, we do notice that um, different markets have different characteristics historically. Um, but when it comes to outliers, um, they're not sort of part of that um, those characteristics. They can occur anywhere and anywhere. So um, the way I view it is that we are 
eliminating any any focus towards the the particular characteristics of an individual market and we're deploying a robust system that is specifically targeting this universal characteristic that outliers occur we don't have profit targets we've got a simple design robust design and we're applying this across all of these different alternate histories this is this is the outer sample um, test that um, Absolute was talking about. We might have um, developed our models on on one market, and then we robustly test them um, across um, you know hundreds, two hundred, three hundred markets. Uh, and if it if it passes those tests, um, then our data sample is very large. So we're we're increase we're we're getting. Uh, sample size from our diversification, as opposed to um, a sample size investing in a individual return stream. Yeah, uh, I think we have to. Uh, uh, you see, when you talk about thousands of markets, uh, you probably mean securities or contracts because there are no thousand markets. There are. Yeah, Just I'm sorry, Mike. I, I was actually meaning return streams. So, you know, um, I might be trading five different trend following or six different trend following models across, say, 60 markets. Therefore, it's 60 times six. So, six, six is 360 return streams. But yes, you're right. There's a, a, only a finite number of markets. Totally agree. Yeah. And also, when we are talking about stocks, uh, most of the back test. I have seen are spurious. Why? It depends what you are doing. The, the, the stock splits distort data. And for instance, if you are using moving averages, it may work. If you are using breakouts, you are getting breakouts that were not there in the past. And then People who I, I've seen back tests of stocks, they are not using delisted series. And for instance, the Russell 2000, some of those stocks went to zero in the dot com uh, and all this. It, it's, it's, for me, it's difficult to, to get around all this for the stock. The, the thousands of stocks uh, in terms of back tests, it, 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 it's quite, uh, it can get quite confusing uh, as far as the results. Uh, the back tests should include all these details. And uh, from what I have seen, not too many do this. Uh, for instance, breakouts, as I said, they, they are spurious. If you keep uh, adjusting for dividends and uh, and split the stocks, they will give you uh, fake breakouts that didn't exist in the past. Uh, these are just a few of the issues uh, with these things. Yeah, Michael, no, Michael, nobody said that was easy. I mean, it, it's not easy and it's not trivial. And uh, I know for a fact that uh, it's doable and um, it's it's a lot of work, and you have to pay attention. You can do split adjusted data, and you can include uh, stocks that don't exist today in your backtest. There are such databases; they're they're not f easily available. But uh, all those things that you mentioned are very valid uh, complaints. And uh, my from my experience is, people who are have done these analyses don't usually publish it or, or whatever. So it's kind of kept under the under the table. Uh, I have published many articles with the listed series. Uh, I use the Norgate uh, data. It's pretty good. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, an agent or something. I don't get don't get me wrong. Uh, but uh, it's good to, to start with for daily data and uh, and you will see you will see how uh, the results change uh, when you are, you use those delisted series and the alpha just disappears from uh, what you think uh, would be the case. Uh, and also the details of the systems are, are important when you back testing, as I said, uh, you know, due to the adjustments. Now the futures, uh, uh, it, you know, only maybe a hundred markets have some liquidity, even less. 
the, the, the rest of the markets, there is simply no, not liquidity there for any serious trading. So we are talking about uh, uh, maybe, as Jerry has said before, we're talking about uh, uh, maybe 200 stocks that are really are worth uh, looking at uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe 100 futures markets uh, that have the liquidity. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, data integrity and data cleaning and data maintenance gathering is its serious business. Uh, this, of course, now, depending on how much resources you have and, and manpower, I mean, just just from, from conversations I've, I've had, and from medall- Renaissance's medallion, they have a huge department of dozens of PhDs just focused on data and database. So basically, no strategy, no math, and whatever. The whole purpose and the whole point is to gather, maintain, clean, and make sure that there's data available and whatever data is available is, is, has integrity and is true and it's correct. So d- data cleanliness and integrity is serious business and is serious concern. And um, d- so you cannot do these things that we're, we're discussing, you know, tens of thousands of, of stocks or whatever you can do. That's a serious business. It's not something that, uh, or you have to be very talented or have like few people around you that are very talented that can maintain this and make sure that you're doing it the right way. So as you, as you said, there's many ways in which you can fool yourself by thinking there is alpha and there may not be. So yes, I, I agree. Absolutely, as your name goes. So this is the name of the game. It's a data science, and uh, and uh, what I have found out, it's easy to say, yeah, let's trade uh, uh, ten thousand markets, uh, and then how do you know the data is clean and, uh, and there are no problems there? And uh, you know, uh, I also do some short-term trading, and every day I have to scan the data to make sure. Uh, the, there are no oh, there are no problems in uh, spikes and uh, you know missed uh, prints and all these absolutely. I'm probably more of a skeptic on all of this of what you guys were saying. Um, I don't think that uh, I've spent two minutes worrying about data in my 39 years. I have no problem choosing my systems with the currencies, commodities, and interest rates, and then whatever optimizes out the best, using that for the stocks as well. In fact, there's been times where we tested the stocks, you know, in the 90s or early 2000s, where they were so good that if we included the stocks, it had a material uh, impact on the parameters we would choose. We were, they were just too profitable. And so we were like, no, ignore that. I don't. We don't want to. Uh, we 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 don't want uh, to use this recent uh, amazing period in equities when they were trending really high, and let them have this undue impact on how we're going to trade the currencies, commodities, and interest rates. And then, as I've said before, um, the I uh, Eric wrote the first paper. That first paper. Uh, does trend following work on stocks under Black Star, and uh, it's out there. And then he talked about early on with me and in the, you know, in the media about how difficult it is to to get the data correct. And he was very intense about this data. It was something he was good at, so he wanted to make everyone know how hard it was. And uh, so then I asked him one day. Did you ever run, and my idea also was that I don't think there's much of an issue with survivorship bias. Like totally write it off. No, it's like that's, don't get concerned about survivorship bias. I'm, I'm trying to get you guys all fired up. I'm just trying, I'm kind of trying to be funny. But honestly, I, I don't put much emphasis on survivorship bias either. And I asked him, I'm like, after he was talking about this survivorship bias, I'm like, seriously, dude. Did you ever run the trend following systems on the stocks that no longer exist? He said, yes. And I'm like, 
what was the performance of those stocks that are no longer in existence that most people would not pay any attention to, i.e. your survivorship bias? He said those stocks made about the same amount of money as the stocks that currently do exist. That's trend following. I know it probably works different from buy and hold and all the client crap, but for trend following, um, I have no problem trading the stocks without even including them in the research. Whatever parameters maximize out for your currencies, commodities, and bonds, I would just use the same ones for the stocks if you're unsure of your stock data. Yeah, Jay, I, I agree. Trend following will work. What won't work is the are the data you get, the 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 numbers you get from from the back test, and it will give you the wrong impression of the potential. Okay, of the if you are if you do not account for the uh, for the delistings, and you would think like you. Your system is making 14% a year when in fact it's like 6% because this is the due to survivorship bias, the, the Apples, the Microsofts, the all the stocks that survive and all those stocks that disappeared in, in the meantime. And uh, and yes, trend following will work. I I I understand. I I I agree with it. The numbers will be wrong. And that's why these people think trend following works for stocks. Well, it depends. It depends on the model. It always depends on the model. That's for sure. I don't know if we have time for Michael's question, Rich, unless you want to take a go at it. Let's leave it for next time, Jerry. <laughs> that's right. That sounds like something you say to Niels every, week, every time you're on. Let's leave it for next time. Too much to talk about. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off then and go downstairs and be with my family for sort of a semi-holiday. Thank you, everybody, for being here and chiming in and for being an ideologue. I really appreciate it. You're encouraging me. I hope I can return the favor. Uh, send me any comments and direct messages about things you'd like to talk about, questions. I'll get back to you or we'll try to bring him up the next time. So until next Friday, everybody have a good weekend and I'll talk to you then.